Hello. I have a couple of announcements before I take your questions. The first is that uh, tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, we will have a uh, news conference here uh, conducted by uh, Dr. Susan Bailey, the Assistant Secretary of Health Affairs, with support from uh, Rear Admiral Michael Cowan of the Joint Staff to bring you up to date on the uh, program to uh, vaccinate the total force uh, for anthrax. That's tomorrow afternoon at 2. On Monday, Secretary Cohen will uh, visit uh, Moody Air Force Base in Georgia as uh, part of his uh, uh, plan to uh, uh, visit bases uh, throughout the military to uh, make his own personal assessment of readiness. And he'll be going down there with uh, General Michael Ryan, the uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force. Also on Monday at, uh, at 3 o'clock, the Department of Defense will uh, dedicate five new exhibitions as part of a series uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of uh, the President Truman's order to integrate the military. And uh, the primary speaker will be Lieutenant General Russell Davis, who's the uh, newly uh, uh, named Chief of the National Guard Bureau. That's uh, here at 3 o'clock. Uh, in the building at 3 o'clock. We can get you. It's on the, uh, uh, it will be uh, held on the third floor, second corridor for those who want to go. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, announce a visitor from uh, New Zealand, Mr. Murray Short, who uh, has the daunting title of General Manager of Collections in the Department of Courts. And uh, he is here as part of a, a four-week uh, 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 program uh, visiting various uh, agents of the agent, uh, agencies of the government. With that, I'll take your uh, questions. Yes. Uh, can I understand the uh, North Atlantic Council has requested General Clark to do a, a survey or on how many uh, troops countries are willing to contribute to air operations? Uh, troops and assets, possible air operations, uh, if, it sh if it should become necessary to, to uh, take action in Kosovo. Does the assessment also include possible land operations? Uh, right. Well, first of all, as the uh, as Secretary General Solana has said, um, uh, NATO is uh, preparing plans for both air and ground operations if called upon to uh, to execute those in Kosovo. Our goal in Kosovo remains clear and remains the same, is to achieve a diplomatic settlement. And we've actually had some important motion in that direction today with the announcement that the, uh, that the Kosovar Albanians have agreed on a negotiating group that will sit down with the Serb side to talk about uh, the uh, parameters of, or terms of a possible settlement. So uh, this is something that uh, Ambassador Chris Hill has been working on for some time. The State Department uh, issued a statement earlier today uh, welcoming the announcement by uh, Mr. Rigova of a, uh, the formation of a Kosovar Albanian negotiating team. But to go back to NATO, uh, should diplomacy fail uh, and uh, should the uh, Serbs continue uh, uh, their attacks, uh, should uh, the sides be unable to reach a peace agreement, and if, uh, and if after that NATO felt called upon to use force, we now have a range of air operations uh, that have been cleared by the North Atlantic Council, and um, they're also working on uh, reviewing some ground operations as well. Now, the ground operations would only come into play if there were a ceasefire agreement or a, uh, or a peace agreement. So uh, they would clearly be uh, following a negotiating success and would be designed to support a negotiating success, um, the success that we all hope will emerge from uh, newly started talks. What General Clark is doing is taking an informal poll of what uh, NATO members would be willing to commit to the air operations. Um, the the uh, formal term for uh, putting together a force is called force generation. 
uh, there has been no order issued by, uh, by the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, General Clark. Uh, but it's an informal poll now to find out what people are willing to contribute should this need arise. And does that apply to possible ground uh, operations if a peace agreement, just kind of a preliminary? Right now, what they're working on are, are air operations, is my understanding. Yeah, that's the, uh, the, uh, the first stage. The United States willing to contribute to air ops? Well, I think it's premature to say right now because we're in the process of, uh, of doing the survey. General Clark is in the process of doing the survey wearing his NATO hat. Um, obviously, we would participate uh, uh, if necessary, just as we participated in the air exercise in June. Yes? Do all of these uh, potential air operations options uh, include taking out all air defenses? There's a range of options, and I don't want to get into them now, but there's a, there's a wide range of options that go from, uh, from uh, uh, sort of what would be a show of force uh, uh, right up to, uh, to uh, significant military action. Yes? Has there been any response that you know of from Milosevic, um, given today's new developments? Uh, not that I'm aware of. New subject. Sure. Are we through with this? Are we, any more questions on Kosovo? Well, yeah, um, would the United States be prepared, however, to, to, to contribute troops to a, um, uh, to a ground force if, if there were a, uh, some sort of a ceasefire or a, or a uh, um, you know, peace between the two sides? Well, that's a decision the President would make after con consulting with his military advisors and with Congress. I think right now, um, the primary consideration is on uh, putting together a possible uh, air force, if necessary, and um, we're, uh, we haven't uh, uh, reached the stage of constituting the ground force yet, or NATO hasn't reached that stage yet. I think it's fair to say that um, the, the United States would, uh, would strongly consider some sort of participation in a, course, in a, in a force to uh, uh, enforce a ceasefire or a peace agreement, but that's a decision the President would have to make after uh, discussing this with, uh, with Congress. Yes, Tammy. Um, Ken, Iraq is again refusing UN Weapons Inspectors access to sites. Is the U.S. going to let this stand? Is this going to stand? The question is, is the U.N. going to let it stand? Um, uh, uh, Iraq, what Iraq is saying is that it's uh, not going to honor the agreement that was made with Kofi Annan earlier this year. Um, the Secretary General came back and, uh, and talked about the importance of this agreement. Iraq honored it for a while. Now it's saying that it's not going to honor it. So this is something that the uh, UN will have to uh, consider and react to. Right now, there is a representative of the Secretary General in Baghdad uh, talking with Tarek Aziz and I believe others about the next steps. And uh, uh, I don't know what those uh, talks uh, uh, will produce, if anything. But the next step would be for those let those talks run their course. Uh, Mr. Shah, the special representative, would then return uh, and either uh, would either return and brief uh, Kofi Annan in person or talk to him by phone before he comes back. And then the UN Security Council will have to decide what to do based on his report. Is the U.S. considering backing up this diplomacy with force at all? Right now, the UN has to decide how to enforce the agreement that Kofi Annan reached with Saddam Hussein. And that's the stage we're at right now. We have a very significant uh, force in the Gulf ready to protect um, our interests and, uh, and to uh, uh, protect the UN interests um, if necessary. But um, right now, this is, is an issue for the UN to resolve. The integrity of the Security Council is at stake. The integrity of the UN is at stake here. And I think this is an affront to every country uh, that sits on the Security Council today. What would trigger another U.S. military buildup? I, th I think it's premature to talk about that. This is a diplomatic dispute between the U.N. and Iraq, and uh, the U.N. is working hard to resolve it. So are yes? You, are you saying that the U.S. would not take any action um, short of a U.N. resolution or some uh, I'm saying that this is a, a diplomatic dispute between the UN and Iraq. 
right now. Um, uh, obviously, we retain the right to uh, protect our forces in the area uh, should they come under threat. Yes. I don't understand what makes this one a diplomatic dispute when every other time the U.S. military has directly uh, gone to the scene, uh, making it a military uh, scenario. Well, first of all, we're in the scene. Um, we have now 20, 23,000 people um, in the Gulf. Uh, since we last talked about the numbers of people there, uh, a, um, uh, an amphibious ready group has arrived on a uh, previously scheduled uh, deployment to the Gulf. So we have 23,000 people there. We have a very significant combat force, um, 165 aircraft. We have uh, a large number of cruise missiles. And we have uh, uh, now Marines in the area. So our force is significant. It's highly ready. And it's exercising every day in the area. Uh, the issue here is the integrity of the uh, UN Security Council and its ability to negotiate and maintain agreements um, uh, between the security, uh, the, the, uh, the Secretary General of the UN and another country. And that's what's at issue here. That's why the, uh, that's why uh, uh, Secretary General Annan has sent somebody to Baghdad to negotiate over the terms of getting inspectors back into doing their job. The, the point here is whether or not Saddam Hussein is going to honor a Security Council agreement, a, a personal agreement between, um, uh, between uh, Iraq and Kofi Annan to allow the inspectors to do their work. It's only through doing their work that the inspectors will be able to certify whether or not um, Iraq has uh, met the terms for uh, ending the uh, sanctions that have been placed against it. Yes. I recall that the most recent crisis in the spring, the U.S. position was that as long as these inspections were not going on, that. Uh, the inspectors were actually getting further and further away from their goal of certifying that he's free of weapons of mass destruction. Is there any period of time that is at which some action would need, need to be taken? Because obviously if the inspectors aren't there, he can do things uh, as far as these weapons go that they're not aware of. That, that is certainly true, and um, that's why it's important for the uh, UN Security Council to find a way to get the inspectors back on the ground. Uh, uh, the every time there's an interruption in the inspections, uh, it leads to suspicions uh, around the world, and certainly by members of the Security Council, that the inspections are being interrupted because uh, Iraq has something to hide. And if they have something to hide, it means that they're far away from meeting the terms of the UN mandate that requires them to uh, abolish their, their weapons of mass destruction stockpiles and their ability to manufacture weapons of mass destruction. This is why the UN Security Council and the members of the Council take very seriously this affront to the Security Council and this violation of the agreement uh, that had been reached earlier with Kofi Annan. Yes, Pat. Referring again to the situation earlier in the year in February and March, the question was raised as to whether military action to enforce the agreement could be taken absent a new UN action. And as I recall, the U.S. government position at that time was that the UN already had spoken, there was a deal in place, and that the United States government could decide to take military action to enforce the existing agreement. How does that differ from the, the circumstance now? Well, I'm not sure that there, that there is a huge difference, but right now the, the play is, the drama here is between the UN Security Council and Iraq. It's the Security Council that has been, uh, in a sense, jilted by Iraq's refusal to adhere to the agreement that was reached with Kofi Annan uh, earlier this year. Well, just to follow that, if the Security Council decides that it is now satisfied as a result of these negotiations that, that the Iraqis are in compliance, is the United States satisfied in that case? I think it's highly unlikely that the Security Council will determine that. If you look at the statements that have been made by other members of the Security Council, every time 
they're very concerned about this, and they consider this a violation of an agreement that was made with Kofi Annan, and they consider this an affront to the Security Council. Every time uh, Saddam Hussein has broken off the inspections and has tried to spurn the Security Council, he has uh, succeeded in unifying uh, the forces of, uh, of uh, arms control against him. Um, he succeeded in unifying people uh, behind the need to take uh, uh, continuing action to remove uh, Iraq's weapons of mass destruction program. That's the issue here. Uh, and uh, that's what the Security Council is focused on, and that's what has been uh, that has, the, 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 the progress toward eliminating those weapons of mass destruction has been slowed by this action by Saddam Hussein. Now the Security Council has to decide what to do. Suzanne. New subject? Sure. Um, are there uh, considerations uh, among uh, high-level uh, Pentagon officials, including uh, Secretary Cohen and General Shelton, to uh, seek an increase in uh, defense spending? Well, the, uh, the budget is in the uh, early stages of review for uh, fiscal year 2000. And uh, certainly, Secretary Cohen and General Shelton are committed to uh, maintaining readiness at high levels and to dealing with readiness problems as they arise. Uh, they have not made a decision yet on what the proper budgetary number should be. Uh, that's under review, uh, and decisions won't be made for some time. So I think it's uh, premature right now to answer that question directly. How concerned is the Secretary that uh, there are problems of a readiness nature among the force? Well, um, he's concerned about uh, the anecdotal reports he's heard, and he's concerned about some of the, some of the data that he's seen. He's uh, uh, convinced, based on uh, everything he knows, that the, uh, the first to deploy forces are highly ready, that the forces that are already uh, uh, deployed in Korea and Bosnia and other places are well trained and ready. Uh, he's, uh, but he's concerned about what he has called an erosion of readiness around the edges with some of the later to deploy forces. And we have taken a number of steps already to improve readiness. Uh, for instance, we, uh, because of the QDR, we added a, a billion dollars to operations and maintenance to deal with readiness concerns. Um, we added another billion dollars after that for Air Force spare parts and, and to address other readiness concerns. Uh, the Army has attacked particular readiness problems, including a shortage of infantry soldiers um, that uh, came about because of a, a recruiting um, uh, and, and, and training problem. Uh, the Navy is working hard now to deal with, uh, with recruiting problems, and both the Air Force and the Navy are working very hard um, in the face of uh, very tough competition from the private economy to deal with, uh, with uh, 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 pilot retention problems. So readiness is a concern. I've said many times up here that there is never, there is no absolute level of readiness. We will never reach a level of readiness at which we can say, ah, we're finished. We don't have to worry about readiness anymore. It's a constant concern. Now, the Secretary has other concerns. He's made a commitment to increase uh, procurement and to, uh, six, uh, to accelerate modernization. One of the reasons he's concerned about procurement is that uh, aging aircraft lead to uh, repair and maintenance problems, which lead to readiness problems. And that, in fact, is what's happening uh, in the Air Force. As aircraft get older, they require more maintenance, and they tend to be less ready. Uh, maintaining them becomes more costly. So it's important to, uh, to bring new uh, planes uh, uh, into the force and new equipment of other sorts as well. Why specifically is he going to move these Air Force base? Um, he has asked the, uh, the chief of every service to uh, uh, go with him on a uh, trip to look at readiness conditions, and he's left that decision to the chief of the service. The first one in line happened to be the Air Force, and uh, General Ryan chose Moody. The, the trip actually was supposed to have made, been made today, but because of the, uh, the sad events at Andrews Air Force Base the, this morning, it was delayed until Monday. 
Barbara. Uh, different subject. Uh, well, uh, hold it. Are there more questions on this? Given the, the state of readiness, which has been deteriorating over the last couple of years, at least anecdotally, and given the fact that the force uh, continues to shrink, are there concerns in this building that may not exist elsewhere that perhaps uh, the U.S. has gone too far in trying to run a lean, mean machine? Well, that's a, a very uh, sweeping question. Uh, there are, there are 23,000 people in this building, and I suspect that, uh, that they all have different uh, views and different concerns. I think that there is a concern about the strains that the high operating tempo uh, is creating uh, on the force, particularly in certain um, very specialized areas, such as uh, AWACS, for instance. Uh, these sort of uh, uh, low-density, uh, high-deploying units. The Joint Staff has been working very aggressively to try to uh, cure some of these problems by reviewing the exercise profile of units, uh, by making sure that, they, that uh, there aren't overlapping uh, unit and sync exercises, uh, by uh, trying to build more predictability into deployments uh, all over the world. And I think they've had some success in doing that. I, nobody anticipated, I think, that uh, the end of the Cold War would uh, bring as many deployments as our military has seen since uh, the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. And uh, we don't know right now, in 1998, whether what we've seen over the last uh, eight or nine years is going to be the pattern of the future, or if it's an aberrational set of deployments. And I think that uh, uh, we'll have to sort that out over time. But obviously, the military is working very hard to deal with these, uh, uh, with the strains caused by these deployments, and I think is having some success. Ultimately, uh, uh, if deployments continue at this, uh, at this very high level, uh, uh, policymakers will have to sit down and decide whether the military should be uh, should be bigger in in certain areas. But I'm not sure we're at that stage yet. Are the, yes. Are those strains uh, one of the reasons why the why uh, uh, the U.S. Is, appears to be taking a pass on this latest uh, challenge from Saddam Hussein? No. This this latest challenge is a challenge to the United Nations Security Council. Yes. Um, again, on the budget issue, you said that there, obviously, there hasn't been a decision on whether or not to ask for more funding in the 2000 budget and beyond. It seems to me that, that the president has already answered that question, um, that things will stay the way they are according to the balanced budget plan. I know he sent a letter to Senator Lott a couple of weeks ago. Are you saying that the Secretary and General Shelton may or may not agree with him? I'm saying the budget's under review right now, and it's premature to talk about uh, how it's going to turn out. Um, the final budget decisions won't be made until the end of the year. Uh, any more questions on readiness? Yes, Pat. Well, let me try it this way. The Secretary was not in any doubt as to what the out-year availability of money was going to be when he was questioned repeatedly on the QDR last year and this year by the congressional committees. He said repeatedly the responsible thing for him to do is to assume roughly $250 billion on out. He couldn't bet on the come for more money. Is the Secretary, is, is that certainty that he presented under repeated questioning, is, is that weakening in his mind? Is that now First an open all, question? When he, when he made those statements, he was assuming very significant savings from BRAC. And um, right now, their, uh, Congress has refused to vote for BRAC and to allow us the savings that would come from being able to shut down unneeded installations around the country. Um, if Congress wants to force us to pay for installations that the military doesn't believe it needs anymore, uh, then obviously we have to look for other ways to uh, uh, fill in for those savings that we've been denied. Uh, that's one change. Um, uh, so there are new circumstances to be considered, and that certainly is one of them. Yes. According to Congress report, DOD officials are considering now approval for the Pope II system to be transferred by Israel to Turkey. Any comment says this transaction is against the Arms Export Control Act, and there is a lot of concern in Athens and Nicosia today.
Um, you asked about the, uh, the Popeye system. Uh, my understanding is that the version of the Popeye system that's produced in Israel is not uh, controlled by the U.S. and does not require uh, any U.S. approval for transfer to other nations. The arrow one. The arrow is different, uh, but you asked about the Popeye, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not aware that the uh, that the arrow is uh, is being considered for transfer. The arrow uh, hasn't even been deployed in Israel yet, to the best of my if my knowledge is is still is still under uh, under development, isn't it? Why then in, in the in the report in the Congress report specifically CRAS say specifically DOD officials are considering now approval for the Popeye system? Why the, I why can't the, explain why the Congressional Research Service said that, um, but my understanding is that the that the version of the Popeye that uh, Israel is considering um, does not require U.S. approval. According to the same um, uh, uh, report, Turkey, in response to Greece's policy of encircling it with military agreements with neighbor countries, formulated a military agreement with Israel against this policy. Any comments is deal with the state many, many times that we use the israeli turkish military agreement as a contribution to regional peace and stability. I'm sorry, what was that last sentence? You stated many, many times from here, from this podium, that we use the israeli turkish military agreement as a contribution to regional peace and stability. Right. Yes. Regional peace and stability. That's exactly Right. I still but, think that. But the report says that Turkey, in response to Greece's policy of encircling it with military agreements with neighbor countries, formulated the military agreement with Israel against Greece. It's quite a contradiction with your opinion. Well, we don't see this as an agreement against Greece. Mm -hmm. I, we just don't uh, see the the uh, the uh, relationship between uh, uh, Turkey and Israel as being against Greece. In fact, Israel has, uh, my understanding is Israel has relationships, has military uh, uh, relationships and discussions with Greece as well. And, and of course, Turkey and Greece are, uh, are allies in NATO. So what, what, do, what do you mean this? <laughs> what do you mean this, Mr. Bacon? They are allies in NATO, but Turkey is, is claiming almost half of the Aegean, so it doesn't make any difference. Well, they're allies in NATO, and uh, the Secretary General has been working very aggressively to uh, try to resolve these disputes through a series of confidence-building measures that would apply to the Aegean. And the, and the last question, Ambassador Nicholas Bell stated the other day in Orlando, Florida, that the U.S. Patriot missile system will be part of Greece's national defense soon. Did you approve this transfer to Greece as a Department of Defense? My understanding is that what Ambassador Burns said is uh, that my strong and fervent hope is that some U.S. systems, such as the Patriot missile, will be part of Greece's national defenses for the next generation. So he, M Ambassador Burns, who is very very um, uh, well schooled in saying exactly what he wants. Uh, use the word hope. Uh, now, hope is different from actuality. Um, what's happened is that the United States, in fact, has licensed Raytheon to market the Patriot to air defense system to Greece. But um, that's just a license to market it. Uh, it's, uh, before any transfer can be made, a number of things have to happen. First of all, Greece has to make a decision what to buy. Uh, and second, um, that has to be uh, uh, considered, uh, uh, that request has to be considered by the United States. So we're, we're, away, we're away from that stage yet. We're at the marketing stage right now, is my understanding on the Patriot. So Ambassador Burns' hope for the future uh, remains bright. Yes, Barbara. Your reaction to the um, story in the Times on early uh, discharge rates going up, is that correct, basically? Are discharge rates uh, skyrocketing, and why do you think that is? Well, first of all, um, the, dis the first term uh, discharge rates um, have been uh, uh, quite high for some time. The standards of the all-volunteer force are very high. Um, we require um, uh, people to be uh, well-behaved, well-disciplined, well-trained, and well-conditioned, healthy, and drug-free. 
and uh, people who can't meet those standards um, uh, frequently do get out in their first term of enlistment. Uh, second, um, there has been some increase in the, uh, of the first term discharge rate in the last couple of years, but that increase corresponds precisely with the period that the military has been downsizing. As you recall, a decision to uh, shrink the size of the military was made um, in 1990, but it was interrupted because of the Gulf War. And it started again in 1993. And the significant downsizing of 36 percent in the size of the uniformed military has taken place uh, largely since 1993. And in that context, of course, there has been probably uh, 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 less need to uh, fight to uh, keep people uh, during their first uh, term of enlistment. So there has been a slight increase. Do you, do you have any statistics handy on what that increase has been? Well, the increase um, uh, varies from, uh, from service to service. I read in the, uh, the introduction to the GAO report, and I might, must tell you that the GAO, GAO report based on this introduction um, uh, points out that um, they have some complaints about the separation coding. This is a typical GAO report that looks at issues like separation coding and the type of information that the services uh, uh, are able to produce for GAO uh, uh, investigators when they come by asking for this information. The GAO report points out that um, the first term attrition rate uh, has averaged 31.7 percent over the last 12 years. Um, that it has risen slightly. Uh, for the Navy, Air Force, and Army, but it's fallen for the Marine Corps. Uh, and this applies to the um, enlistees uh, who entered the services in the fiscal year 1993. Um, yeah, fiscal year 1993. That's what they're looking at here. And that's, pardon? These are people who enlisted in 93. So they've been in for, uh, they've been in for a while. In other words, if they enlist for four years and in, in they, they started in 1993, they're looking at that cohort, that class of people um, entering the military. Um, I do not see an overall, just looking at this thing, I mean, you can, probably get a copy of this thing uh, summary here. But my, my recollection is that the overall attrition rate has increased to 35 or 36 percent from the average of close to 32 percent over the last 12 years. How do you, how do you characterize what some are calling a soaring rate? Well, I don't consider that soaring. I don't consider a change of several percentage points soaring, particularly in the context of, one, continued high standards for people to serve in the military, and two, the military's um, uh, reduction in force that really took hold starting in 1993. I think we have to look now uh, at the stable state military and to see what happens to the first term attrition rate. Um, now that the military has pretty much reached its, um, its reduction goals. The military has come down from 2.1 million to uh, about uh, 1.4 million and um, plans to stay at pretty much that size. So the issue is what happens to the first term attrition rate in this new uh, uh, stable state environment? Yes? Can I turn to a different subject briefly? Just, just one more. Okay, sure. Uh, just to say, is there any uh, uh, definition? In that, in that uh, percentage increase of what might have caused it, is there any category at all that has increased more than any other? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I mean, one of the uh, complaints of the GAO is that the, uh, that the separation coding isn't precise enough to allow that type of, uh, of consideration. But uh, this is what I can, I can tell you, that, um, uh, that uh, about 70 percent of the men who leave during the uh, first term uh, leave uh, because of uh, misconduct or bad conduct 
uh, medical conditions, uh, performance problems, or drug use. A little uh, uh, over 71 percent of the women who separate during the first term leave uh, because of pregnancy, medical problems, misconduct, performance shortfalls, or parenthood. So those are the major reasons why people leave during their, their first terms. I don't have the, uh, the order there. Yeah. I mean, those are the major reasons. I don't know exactly what the order is. Yes, Brian. Um, do you have any any new information on the uh, the Titan IV explosion yesterday and what might have caused it? I'm afraid I don't. I mean, the Air Force will be looking into that and reporting back. And can you talk at all about how how much the grounding of the fleet might affect future launches? Are there ones that are scheduled soon that will have to be delayed? Well, I think the uh, that was the uh, as I understand it was the last uh, uh, launch of the Titan IV-A. And the next launch, um, I believe, is the Titan 4B. It's supposed to take place in December. And uh, I, I gather that um, uh, that the uh, whether or not that launch takes place on schedule will depend in part on what they determine from from this uh, uh, failure yesterday. Yes. Do you have any decision uh, yet on the uh, waivers for burial at Arlington of uh, at least three people from the Nairobi? Um, explosion. Um, uh, this is um, now before the president, and I expect a uh, decision uh, to become a, uh, to come out from the White House very soon. Today. Yes, I would guess today. The decision is not being made by uh, the Secretary of the Army. The decision is being made by the president. And um, I think it's uh, appropriate for the White House to announce what the President's decision is. Can, uh, regarding Kenya? Yeah. Uh, earlier this year, the Central Command uh, did a vulnerability assessment, which I understand found some deficiencies in security at the embassy. Uh, can you tell me what the Department or CENTCOM's report said and uh, what the vulnerabilities were? Well, I heard a lengthy commentary on this on NBC News, and it seemed to me you already knew what it said. Um, I have nothing to say about an internal uh, government report which was uh, classified secret. What I can tell you is that uh, several things. First, that the, um, that the uh, State Department is uh, primarily responsible for embassy security. Nevertheless, the military and the State Department work very closely together on making sure that uh, all installations where Americans serve abroad are uh, safe and secure. And uh, uh, the uh, Commander-in-Chief of the Central Command, as do the Commander-in-Chiefs of all the commands, uh, do make assessments from time to time of security conditions in their areas where, where uh, uh, military people may serve. Were there recommendations that the military made to the State Department about beefing the, up security? I think the State Department should talk about this. They um, uh, talked about this last night. As I said, embassy security is their job, and uh, they're the appropriate people to discuss this. None yes. the, nonetheless, are Secretary Cohn and General Shelton satisfied that the military mm -hmm. has enough of a say in embassy security in uh, countries? Uh, where there are military personnel, even if it is only six Marines, are, are Cohen and Shelton looking at this? Are they uh, looking as a result of Clinton saying, everybody look at everything, any changes in procedures or, or something like that? Or are they happy with the way things are? Well, I think everybody in the government um, uh, realizes now and realized before this tragedy that um, there are some security problems. The issue is, uh, is uh, how quickly they can be cured. Uh, in the current budgetary environment. And uh, obviously, uh, Secretary Cohen and General Shelton are working with everybody else in the government, or the whole national security team, to find the best way to make uh, embassy secure and to make secure any place where uh, U.S. military personnel serve. Five of the people uh, killed in Nairobi um, were either uniformed uh, 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 military people or civilian military people. So, yes, we have a real stake in embassy security, and we work very closely with the State Department on that topic. 
Yes, Brian. Let's see how general you mentioned here on Tuesday had sent a message to the commanders in chief to um, tell them to, to reevaluate their security procedures and make any changes. Do you know if if any of the sinks in the Pacific, CENTCOM, Europe have done taken any steps in recent days to beef up security? Um, well, we don't usually talk about security changes, but um, the answer is yes. Some did respond to that um, by beefing up security. But the fact is that security is a top concern of every sink every day. And uh, we collect uh, a lot of intelligence, which we review aggressively. Um, the uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines uh, uh, in their uh, operations are constantly aware of security. And uh, sinks are uh, every day making uh, little changes in their security postures to fit the, uh, the conditions of that day. So um, all General Shelton was doing was uh, taking the opportunity of the, uh, of the tragedy in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam to remind sinks to do what, um, what uh, they are already doing. Yes, Chris. Uh, apparently in mid-June, the State Department put out a sort of a, a generalized uh, uh, security alert, not, not very focused. Did, did the Pentagon's uh, uh, forces around the world, were they, it, were they affected by that? Um, well, to the extent that the, the State Department uh, alert applied to all Americans, um, uh, we were affected by it. But every day, uh, military commanders around the world are assessing uh, security threats and risks. And every day, they're making adjustments. These adjustments might be to uh, stop shore leave um, uh, for Navy sailors. Uh, they might uh, uh, confine uh, uh, soldiers or airmen to their bases. Uh, they may be to uh, change, uh, to uh, augment the guards. Uh, it may be to change the vehicle inspection procedures. Uh, it, it may be to change the patterns that are used by uh, uh, military vehicles that, uh, that, uh, that uh, go to and from bases so that people don't drive on the same predictable route every day. There are hundreds and hundreds of little changes that can be made on a daily basis and are made. Uh, this is just part of military life, and uh, it's a very important part of military life, and it's one that every, every member of the military takes seriously, but particularly the sinks. So I, I don't want to uh, – uh, we, we are constantly responding to threats we get. Ambassador Pickering said the other day that the uh, State Department receives 30,000 threats a year and considers every single one. Uh, the military receives a huge number of threats, um, and, and we take all of these threats seriously. Uh, not all of them turn out to be credible, obviously. And as I pointed out before, the nature of intelligence uh, and really the nature of security operations <laughs> is that, that the failures are very public and successes are very private. And um, uh, it, it's, it's too bad that we can't talk about some of our successes, but we do have many successes uh, based on our vigorous uh, force protection program. In retrospect, uh, should everyone have paid more attention to General Zinni? Um, that's a troublemaking question. You're, you're, uh, uh, the, in retrospect, people should always pay attention to sinks, and they do. Um, I don't think the issue here is whether uh, whether people don't pay attention to security warnings. They pay attention all the time to threat changes and to warnings. That's the whole point of what I was talking about for the last five minutes. Everybody takes these seriously. The State Department takes them seriously. The military takes them seriously. This is not an issue of not taking threats seriously. Um, it's an issue uh, about um, uh, staying constantly vigilant and responding to threats as best as possible, given the resources at hand. Yes, Chris. The uh, terrorism report that was mentioned, um, what was the purpose of the report? Um, it, again, you covered it sort of, but Are were you changes about made. 2000? Right. Were changes made as a result of the findings of the report, and was the report not initially intended for release, and then not released? I can't answer that question. This report um, was done before I came to the building uh, in 1994. 
And uh, I do know that there were uh, extensive interviews given about the report at the time it came out. This report was not a secret. Its findings weren't a secret, and its recommendations weren't a secret. Um, uh, they were uh, uh, one of my military assistants, Lieutenant Colonel Scott, arranged many of these interviews with the people who worked on the report. So we didn't hide this at all. Um, why specifically we didn't release the report at the time, I just, I just don't know. The fact of the matter is that this report was one in a whole series of efforts that have been underway in the department for a long period of time to adjust to this grave new world where the transnational terrorist threat is real and has to be taken seriously. Um, you may remember that President Clinton attended an international anti-terrorism uh, uh, conference uh, in, in Egypt, I believe it was, um, uh, several years ago. And uh, this is an issue that's received top-level attention from the President on down for not just the last uh, year, not just the last two years, but for a long period of time. Uh, in terms of security posture uh, as a result of the Well, I don't know what specific changes were made as a result of that report, but um, changes have been made. Uh, the, the Defense Department has been paying much more attention to the terrorist threat um, for a number of years. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly um, since 1994, we have made a significant number of changes in our security posture. And one of the changes is to uh, is to make sure that all commanders see this as a as a top level command concern. Um, but we started making uh, certainly very aggressive changes um, after the uh, bombing in Riyadh in uh, in November of 1995, and um, uh, we accelerated those changes after the Kobar Tower bombing in Saudi Arabia in uh, 1996. Yes. In the NATO military exercise in Firon from September 10th to 18th, have you decided how many U.S. troops and what type of forces will be assigned? Um, I'm sure the answer is yes. We've decided both of those things, and I probably don't have the information, but uh, we can get that for you. That'll be easy enough. Yes? Could I have a quick return to back to Iraq? Iraq. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm trying to work out here. You, what you seem to be saying is that there's no difference, really, between the American response to Iraq's refusal to comply with UN um, uh, inspectors last year and, and early this year with the refusal, with the same Iraqi refusal now. And yet, when you look at it, in public, there is a very big difference in the American response. The difference is that then there was a major military threat or threat of military reprisal, and now you're simply refu referring everybody back to the UN. There is, on the surface there, a big difference. Can you explain whether there is a difference or there isn't? I mean, it seems, it seems to me that there is. Last fall, Iraq made public threats to shoot down U-2 aircraft and took other actions that led us to believe that they were trying to shoot down uh, planes participating in Operation Southern Watch. As you know, planes from three nations participate in Operation Southern Watch. Um, in response to those threats, we sent a carrier into the Gulf and uh, took other steps to augment our forces there. Um, that was clearly a threat directed specifically against United States forces in the Gulf. This situation is a violation of an agreement between the Secretary General of the United Nations and Iraq. And what's at stake here is the integrity of the UN Security Council and its ability to enforce or carry out uh, its own mandates. And that's why Secretary General Kofi Annan has sent uh, his representative, Mr. Shah, to Iraq, where he is today, uh, negotiating with Iraqi officials trying to get the inspections back on track. Any trip movements by the uh, Iraqi um, uh, Not that I'm aware of, no. I thought the build-up was largely, or was also because of the threat to the rest of the world posed by Iraqi's biological weapons. There, that that build-up 
uh, that threat continues um, because the international community has not yet been able to prevail uh, in convincing Iraq of the importance of dismantling its entire chemical and biological weapons uh, arsenal and uh, productive capability. That's what this whole dispute is about. That's why it's so important to the United Nations. That's why it's so important to the Security Council. And that's why the Security, why the uh, uh, UN Secretary General has a representative in Baghdad today talking to the Iraqis. Yes, Dale. Different subject. Yeah. Um, Secretary Cohen has sent uh, several messages to the Navy leadership uh, over the past several months, or I guess even a year, to the effect that he's not satisfied with what the Navy's doing about countermine warfare. Uh, he was, there was a report that he was to receive a briefing on that subject uh, this week. Can you tell us if he got the briefing and what, uh, if anything came out of it? The briefing began 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, can we move the, the former Zaire? Congress? Zaire. The uh, Democratic <coughs> Republic of the Congo. Um, I understand that there's some fairly advanced planning going on in UCOM about a possible non combatant evacuation or whatever those things are called. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Have some forces been identified? Is there some amphibious ships in the area? Um, yesterday morning, the uh, USS Saipan uh, left uh, Marseille, France at uh, 4 a.m. local time and uh, started a trip uh, down toward the uh, Congo, it, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And um, it'll take nine or 10 days for the ship to get down there. It has on it um, uh, 1,200 Marines. I think there are actually two ships going down. It's, it carries elements of the 22nd uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit. Um, no decision has been made to uh, uh, evacuate Americans from uh, the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, we estimate that there are currently uh, 250 to 260 Americans there. Um, that number is down uh, rather sharply over the last couple of days. Um, there is still commercial air service coming out of Kinshasa and uh, possibly other cities as well, so it's possible for people to leave. Um, of the 250 to 260 Americans there in the country, um, most of them are outside of Kinshasa. Some will be missionaries and others who may decide to stay um, uh, if they, uh, those who want to leave uh, presumably are making their way to Kinshasa now. The State Department, as I said, has made no decision to evacuate Americans at this stage. And uh, all we are doing is positioning ourselves to uh, uh, be ready should such a decision be made uh, by the State Department. Do you know the other ship, what that, that is, and also any reports on what's going on on the ground today? Um, I understand that uh, today, from uh, reading the State Department guidance, that things are uh, relatively uh, uh, quiet, but you should go. Um, I, I don't have a, a, a direct re report on that. Uh, my understanding is that um, the two ships are the Saipan, which is an LHA-2, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Tortuga, which is uh, an LSD-46. They are moving down is toward the... Pardon? Pardon? Is there a UCOM advance team on the ground already? <coughs> Uh, th there is an advanced team on the ground, yes. In, in the Republic of No, it's in uh, Gabon. If you go back and uh, review uh, what happened uh, last year, um, it's basically what people are thinking of as the same sort of uh, operation. We sent, uh, uh, we established a, an air operation in Libreville, and um, uh, uh, it ferried assets into Brazzaville. Uh, and uh, people came out of Kinshasa into uh, Brazzaville, and then we took them back to Libreville and, and out that way. This is such a small number of Americans, you would think you could just put them all on a charter, single charter flight well, or something. That's, like that. There may be no need um, for an evacuation. That's one of the things that the State Department will have to decide. All, all we're doing is, because of the distance, making some preliminary uh, preparations. Uh, no decision's been made, and, and it may be we decide there's no need. Um, however, 
there are um, uh, other people from other countries there, and um, sometimes we we assist uh, um, with uh, with people from other countries. Yes. Of the 250, how many are official uh, American? Is that I think there's a, there's a very a small number of official Americans there now. Um, uh, yeah, they are included in that number. Thank you. You're welcome.